also thanks to Civic Camp and to the Mid Sun Community Association for hosting this event. My name is Sean Kale, and I'm a resident of Ward 14, just like you guys. Uh, most of you here. Um, that's not a shot. That's for people over here. Um, I live in a family community of Lake Bonavista with my lovely wife, three amazing daughters, and a mischievous puppy. Um, I was born in Spirit River, grew up in Grand Prairie, finished high school and university in Edmonton, and have lived in Calgary for the last 16 years. My professional career is in IT management. Uh, in my job, I am expected to make sure that company systems run at optimal efficiency, and when I work on a project, it always has to come in under budget. I volunteer exclusively in the community, extensively I mean, in the community, mostly coaching youth soccer and sitting on various boards uh, for community organizations. In fact, I'm working three or four casinos uh, in the weeks following the election. Does anybody else have problems saying no? Does anyone else want to volunteer for these casinos? So I ran for this job in 2010 and I came close. However, that is not my reason for running. Um, after the last election, I was obviously keeping tabs on what the City Council was doing. And unfortunately, I saw a disturbing trend. We are spending crazy amounts of money. Um, next year, we will have an airport tunnel that goes to nowhere. Um, the $300 million price tag is equivalent to 12 peace bridges, just to put it into perspective. Did we have alternatives? It's hard to not look at a map and see Country Hills Boulevard and Stony Trail staring in back in the face. Um, in the meantime, the city share of the property taxes have gone up by over 30% uh, during the last three years, and the Southeast LRT is not even on the Calgary Transit priority list anymore. Um, there's, a, there's six priorities, it's not even on the list. Number six is called the set, set rate. Um, at the same time, not much has happened to keep the city affordable for seniors on fixed incomes and those who are in a much lower income bracket. What can we do to fight this? We have a strong voice to represent Ward 14, so this kind of thing does not happen. When we hear rumors about an Anderson TOD that will greatly add density, we need Thank to you, Sean. Sure. Thank you. Peter, you have two and a half minutes for your intro. Hello. Thanks for, well, you guys pretty much covered the things. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Peter DeMong. I'm your current alderman. Um, I am applying for another four-year limited term contract. Um, I moved here into Calgary in 78. Uh, I grew up in Buena Vista with Fish Creek in my backyard. I've lived in Queensland, mid Point and Deer Run. My wife and I have owned and operated Deer Valley Florist for the last 17 years. For the last three years, I've been working for you, Ward 14 residents. Um, I've done a number of initiatives that I'm quite proud of to basically try and get your voice, hear what you have to say, one of them is the Alder Talks that uh, hopefully you've heard about. It's basically about the same amount of people as here. Sit around a round table and discuss just about anything, which is probably going to be similar to what we're talking about here. Uh, I've also initiated a grade six essay contest uh, for Ward 14 schools to try and get their input, to try and get them involved in the schools, uh, in, in municipal politics, I should say, get their interest level up because they are the future voters. They are, they are the people that we are going to be depending on in our old age. I've also done Ward 14 Community Association Barbecue, which basically is trying to raise awareness and needed funds for your local community associations. They're a valuable volunteer organization that you may not be aware of, but does an awful lot of good for you, whether it be lobbying the city uh, through their aldermen, whether it be holding their the jelly bean dance in the local community association, or for that matter, just keeping a facility operating. So they're vitally, vitally important to our organization. A number of things that uh, I have been working on is trying to convince council to not be raising taxes. I have not voted in favor of a tax increase for the last three years. Uh, I've been gaining strength in council with regards to how many I've convinced. The first time I was standing alone, which is very difficult. If you want to try for a change, you've got to realize that it's tough to stand up by yourself and say what has to be said. Uh, the second vote was uh, I had convinced two other of my council members to join me. By the time the third vote came through, it was, it was a matter of 10 to 5. So there is some strength. There is some people starting to follow what I'm trying to say. I have been saying it loud and clear for the last three years. We cannot sustain these tax increases. The fact of the matter is when you're outvoted in council, there's only so much one vote can do. I've done my best. 
Thank you, Peter. So we will now begin our first question, which is directed at Peter first and then Sean second. The question is our top question on our user voice website. And that is, do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods, subject only to reasonable safety concerns? Why or why not? You have two minutes, Peter. The fact is, no, I don't. Um, there is, I, I do not personally have anything wrong with the secondary suite, but the, the concept, it's an actual misnomer about legalizing secondary suites. We can adjust the zoning so that you can, you, you're allowed to have a secondary suite in the city, but the real reason that secondary suites aren't being built is the cost involved. When you have to deal with the Alberta, the Alberta Building Code, the fire safety codes, this is a, a monumental cost involved. A blanket rezoning would simply say, anybody that wants to build, go ahead and build. And there would be no checkpoint, checkpoints. There would be nobody to say, hey, are you building that safe? At least with the system we've got now, you have your neighbors to be involved, you have your neighbors' comments to say, hey, what are you doing, what's up? And they will probably keep, keep, keep a check mark on what you're doing. To me, it's a far better system to say, let's monitor what's going on in our neighborhood. The fact of the matter is, over the last two years in council, we have actually rezoned approximately 150,000 units across the city and we've seen such a marginal uptake, it's maybe 200 units a year, that it's, I don't see the reason for it. Having said that, there's also the, the concept that you have bought your you bought in a neighborhood specifically for, you researched your neighborhood, you know their secondary suites aren't allowed. That was wonderful, it's a great, great idea. Fact of the matter is, in new neighborhoods, I brought forward a notice of motion to say, now in new, no sorry, tongue tied here. In all new neighborhoods, new purchasers are going to know that secondary suites are allowed and it's something they go in knowing full well that it's able to be done. So it's something that you go in with full knowledge. Thank you, Peter. Sean, you have two minutes. Um, well, this is one of the issues where um, Peter and I do differ. There is an affordability issue in this city. and. Uh, just saying no to it and ignoring it is going to make it go away. Um, do I think secondary suites is a magic bullet solution? They are not, but they are part of the solution. Um, council voted to push secondary suites to the outskirts, to new neighborhoods on the outskirts of town. The problem in those neighborhoods is that they have high density already, and um, parking is an extreme issue up there, and people don't have um, proper transit to get them to where they need to go. So what I'm proposing, is secondary suite policy, but with a cap. Um, I've done my research research on this, and I found that most cities that instill secondary suite policy don't have uptake of more than 10. Um, but the problem is people are very worried about getting secondary suite policy, and all of a sudden, if you have a thousand houses, you have a thousand suites. That that isn't true. That will not happen. Um, you want to, for my for my proposal, I want to make it owner occupied only, so we're not having people just buying rental properties and single family neighborhoods and putting in suites. So we'd have owner occupied. We'd have a ten percent cap, of which, um, from what I understand, would probably not be reached at any given time. And we'd have we would want to have parking uh, criteria so the streets are not overcrowded. Um, the problem in the city is a, a lot of times the people who are working and need to live in these suites are not the type, not people who can live on the very outskirts of town because they have no way of getting to their jobs, they have no way of getting to um, the, the functions that, that they need to do in this city. So, so for myself, um, I support them, but with a cap, uh, owner occupied, and with parking clause. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Oh, and I see Peter is going to respond with, and you have one minute. Well, if you'd actually done your research, you realize that owner occupied isn't legally binding. We cannot legally force somebody to be doing that. The problem with the 10% cap is you're going to have areas in the city, and we do have areas with a higher than 10%. You're going to be going in, going in and shutting down where they are legally zoned properly to get rid of some of these because you're past the 10%. If that theory, if you follow the 10% theory a little farther, doesn't that mean that in 20, 30 years when you're at the maximum 10%, 
you're not allowed to build any more in that community. You can't build a new one. You have to keep all the 40 and 50 year old suites. Um, over and above that, yeah, no, that'll do. Okay, thank you, Peter. Are there any more responses? Nope, so we're gonna go into our next question. And this question will be, we'll have Peter go again and Ms. Sean go after. And the question is, how will you ensure all Calgarians have access to recreational and sports facilities they need for their ongoing health and well-being? So Peter, you have two minutes. Well, the fact of the matter is you cannot ensure that all Calgarians have access to it. What you can do is build what is appropriate for the neighborhood when the funding allows. Uh, what we have done is uh, in 2011, we increased the uh, levies for uh, home, de home builders, developers, uh, by, by approximately double. A good portion of that money is actually going into recreational levies, which goes towards recreational centers, anything along those lines. We also have a uh, minimum 10% municipal reserve by, uh, rule in place where people can, where, where developers have to set, up, set aside that much room for play areas, for future play areas, parks, etc. Um, it's awkward, I understand, but that is part of the problem with being in a boom and bust economy in the, of, of Calgary. You have a number of people moving very quickly into the city, and then you have some lag time while the infrastructure catches up. If we had a guaranteed, we're only going to allow 3% of the people to increase, or 3, 2%, whatever that number is, that would be a wonderful way to build a city, and a lot of cities actually have that just regular growth. Calgary is unique, as you probably all well know. We boom, and then we bust. It takes some time for lagging infrastructure to catch up. Okay, thank you, Peter. Sean, you have two minutes. Um, so this, this topic is pretty near and dear to my heart, because... Um, I was pretty active in sports growing up. I do think it's very important to maintain active lifestyles. Uh, my kids play sports, and the reason is not so they'll play on the national team. The reason is so they'll have teamwork and um, you know learn leadership. So, answering the question about funding, uh, yeah, definitely funding is very hard to come with. Uh, what Peter says is completely correct. The developers' uh, subsidy has increased. Uh, we want to keep talking with the developers about this. Um, one thing that we can do to probably help expedite this issue is, um, you know, I was just up in Edmonton last year with, uh, with my daughter for a soccer tournament, and in every quadrant of the city they have a soccer center. And you walk into these soccer centers and they are pretty plain Jane, but they took what money they had and they built facilities for each quadrant. Um, I'm not sure why here, if you go up to the Genesis Center in Northeast, they have this big silver metallic ball that, you know, I'm sure it's nice, but I don't see why people would go up there to see that ball specifically. People are going up there to stay in shape and play sports and participate in recreation. So um, we do have to revisit this policy of, you know, it's sad to say, but you, you, you kind of look at what Edmonton builds and look at what Calgary builds. And Edmonton probably builds twice as many facilities as we do, just with the same amount of money, just because they are trying to get use and function, but not necessarily make it look like a Cadillac. So that's where I'm coming from. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Are there any responses? Nope. So the next question, um, I want to give you a little bit of context because this question actually just skyrocketed on our uh, user voice website over the past few days. So, and it made it to our top 10, so I am going to ask it. Uh, and the first person I'll ask it to is, oops, there's only one. Sean will go first, and then Peter. And the question is, what would you do to get the McLeod Trail Sun Valley Boulevard interchange built to reduce shortcutting traffic on Sun Valley Boulevard? Sean, you have two minutes. Um, you know, definitely it, it is part of a project where they have kind of deemed it part of the Southwest Ring Road, and of course we know that the Southwest Ring Road is not even a for sure thing yet. We have kind of hope at the, light of the, at the end of the tunnel, maybe with 
when the city to vote uh, next month. But um, it definitely is a provincial project and it falls in the province's hands. What your city councillor can do is be a real pain or be a real, I guess, close friend to Transportation Minister Rick McIver. Um, I have no problems taking Rick out for lunch every single day until he gets sick and tired of seeing my face. Um, I think it's one of those things where you try to get movement and try to reason with them just to, just to say that, you know, listen, you're going to have to build this at some time, so why not do it now because you're going online with the Southeast Ring Road pretty soon and your bottleneck is still going to be this McLeod Trail interchange. Um, it's, I know there's not a ton of money to go around, but you know whether they build it, build it now or build it later, um, they're going to have to build it because once they do the Southwest Ring Road, there's no way that inter there's no way that interchange handles the traffic now, and definitely will not when Southwest Ring Road comes online. So, um, for myself, I definitely uh, lobby uh, Minister McIver, um, MLA Rick Fraser, uh, MLA Jeff Wilson. He's uh, you know he's part of this too with Calgary Shaw. So uh, it's based on having good relations and also putting good but firm pressure on them. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Peter, you have two minutes. I hate to break it to you, Sean. You were talking about the wrong interchange. Um, the question was, again... Oh, sorry. Can you pause the time? Sorry. So the question was, I can repeat it, um, what would you do to get the McLeod Trail Sun Valley Boulevard interchange built? To reduce shortcutting traffic on Sun Valley Boulevard. Oh. Um, Sorry, that's what I saw I read online. Uh, here, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll read the comment here so just to give it some. There's a significant problem in the community of Sundance with traffic shortcutting down Sun Valley Boulevard to avoid the severe congestion at McLeod Trail and 22X. This project languishes, languishes at the top of the city's unfunded infrastructure list as there is a lack of support on council for dealing with South Calgary traffic issues. Sure. We'll go with that one anyway then. Okay. Um, both, both interchanges are of vital importance. I have, just to, to backtrack, the 162nd one that I thought the question was on about was, is, has been put at the top of the list for the next 10 year capital budget. I've gotten it approved through council as their top ranked priority. Uh, the 22X overpass, as you remember during the last election, they were planning on absolutely doing nothing until the, 20, until the uh, Southwest Ring Road was originally put through. I actually did something very similar to what Sean was suggesting. I did hound Alberta Transportation, I did hound our own city brass, and I did manage to get it to the functional study point, they came out with an open house at South Fish Creek to describe exactly what they were going to do as little as late as last summer, saying this is the overpass we're going to be doing. This is a complete with uh, uh, um, round a <laughs> sorry uh, The entire interchange was going to be coming forward. Uh, unfortunately, shortly after that, the province came forward and said, "Well, listen, we've got something called this bitumen bubble. We have a Highway 63 that needs twinning." and we're going to be shutting this project down completely. I went back, hounded Alberta Transportation again, and said, this is not good enough. We have an absolutely critical intersection here that's going to be absolutely ludicrous with six lanes in and four lanes out each direction. They did relent, and they are doing some minor upgrades. So I guess you could say they downgraded their upgrades to, a mar to, <laughs> to do something. There will be two lanes each direction on, the on, on top of the bridge deck, uh, there will be an extra set of lights. I'm not convinced that that extra set of lights is going to slow traffic. My understanding is they will be somewhat synchronized. The fact of the matter is the lights are required because there's approximately 40 accidents on that bridge deck every year, six of which involve injuries. Thank you, Peter. The next question will go to Sean first, Peter second. And the question is, how do you think we can create greater mobility choices, biking, walking, and transit, in addition to cars, in the city and in your ward? Sean, you have two minutes. Oh, well, this is another interesting question. Um, in Ward 14, 
we have a lot of, we have a mix of established communities and new communities. Um, the new communities where you have, you, you have a real chance to affect this to a greater extent because um, you can affect the design of the community. Um, you can make things walkable, you can have uh, retail stores in, in good locations, recreation space in good locations. Um, I'm fortunate to live in a neighborhood like Lake Bonavista where every, everything is pretty much walkable. Um, we can walk to the mall, we can walk to the rec center, we can walk to the lake, um, we can ride our bikes to Fish Creek Park. Um, so for a neighborhood like Bonavista, it, it's really tough to say what you could do to it. Um, when you look at other neighborhoods, um, you're looking at retrofitting things. So this involves projects coming up on, and that, that are coming online that council has to look at, that the city has to look at to see what are the benefits. Um, one thing that I always mention was the Anderson TOD. When I went to look at the open house for that, um, it looks very nice. Um, you know, they have restaurants, they have office space, they have some condos. Um, the problem is that they're taking away a lot of the parking at Anderson uh, Sea Train Station, and I'm hearing that the density is a lot greater than what was shown at the open house. So those are things that your city council has got to watch out for. Um, just to make sure that, yes, we want to head this way, we want to make sure we're increasing density a bit in the established areas, but we want to make it such that we don't affect the people who are living there already. Um, if you're adding, you know, 2,000 cars to an area, that's a big thing, like look at showing slopes, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, it can be done, it just has to be done smartly, and it has to be done with community consultation. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Peter, you have two minutes. Well, in the last three years that I have been a councillor, what we put in place is all new communities do have a mandatory regional pathway system that will be in place going in. Uh, that will be in place at Legacy. Uh, in uh, Silverado has an existing pathway. But in any of, the new, any of the new communities coming forward, there is a mandatory regional pathway system, which is basically that three meter to five meter wide pathway system. Um, it's... It is difficult to retrofit an existing community, but it's not impossible. Thanks to the hard work of, of a number of the community volunteers here in Sundance, we are going to be seeing some extra bike pathways along Sun Mills, Sun Mills Drive. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate the help with that. You did, you did a lot of the heavy lifting on that, and I appreciate that. And the Sun, Sundance Mid-Sun Traffic Watch. Thank you as well. Um, part of the problem is the retrofitting onto an existing system. I was actually quite in favor of expanding the pathway system that we have. Uh, unfortunately, there have been some problems with some water of late. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to deal with that. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is we have the most extensive pathway system in North America, uh, in Calgary. I'd like to see that expanded to be able to be more adaptable for both pedestrians and cyclists. Over and above that, I am certainly in favor of doing similar situations like we've done in, Sun, uh, in uh, what we're going to be doing in Sundance in other neighborhoods. The advantages are more than just increasing pedestrian and cycling mobility. The advantage also has to do with traffic safety. It has an impact on the, on the way traffic flows when you have an extra lane, whether it be a cycle lane, whether it be um, the traffic bulbs that are going to be coming forward. But that in itself can be used to help mitigate a lot of the traffic speeding concerns that we have in, Cal in, in Ward 14, right down to zero. Thank you, Peter. Sean, you have two minutes. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm losing. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you I'm, go, girl. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, does anyone else want to respond? No. Okay. So, person... Can everybody hear me? Listen with your right ear. <laughs> no? Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so the next person for my question is going to be Sean again, and then Peter second. And the question is, do you believe that Calgary requires a city charter? What powers does the city need that it does not currently have? So you have two minutes. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it's necessarily about power. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, 
Calgary City Charter is important. They were talking about the big city charter with Edmonton and Calgary. Just so the cities will have more defined rules and what uh, what they are responsible for, and it will kind of uh, it will help set the framework for how we get our funding. Um, a lot of times, right now, you look at this and you want to build a road or want to build an interchange or something. We don't have the money for it, so we have to go to the province for money. Um, would, do we get the money? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. So it, it is tough for a city to kind of set its priorities when it doesn't know what kind of funding it's get, gonna get. Um, you know, a prime example I'll give to you is the Southeast LRT. Um, right now it's not on our, not on our uh, top six list. So if we went to the province right now and asked for funding for the Southeast LRT, it would be really tough to push that through because it doesn't look like we have consensus on council about it. Um, so the city charter is very important so we know that we have a more stable source of funding. Um, when you look at community associations, they, they have a similar problem. You apply for grants, you don't know if you're going to get it. So, I know in the city charter they talk about maybe the city is getting power of tax taxation. Um, I'm not necessarily in favor of us getting that. Um, because until we get our spending under control, um, I'm not sure if we want to have the keys to that part. And that's where I'm coming from. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Peter, you have two minutes. What was the question again? Sure. So the question was, sorry, do you believe that Calgary requires a city charter? What powers does the city need that it does not currently have? So I can't just go with yes? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, um, yes, the city of Calgary does need a charter. Uh, arguably, we are the fifth largest province in Canada. You've probably heard that before, but the MGA, which is the Municipal Government Act that rules the uh, requirements and uh, how we govern as a city, is exactly this, is exact, deals with us exactly the same way as a town of 2,000 people. We have a lot of different priorities involved with a city of 1.3 million. Um, it's, it's not, a lot of it doesn't have to do with taxation powers. That to me is, 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 a, is an area where I'd be very, have, hold a very uh, skeptic eye to see how that would come forward. But there is another, uh, there's a number of other areas where the MGA restricts what the city can do with regards to how it deals with its citizens, how it tries to help its citizens, and in the legalities involved. We are not the same as a 2,000 person town. We have a lot more difficulties from <laughs> From land zoning from to homelessness, it, it is an entirely different context. So yes, we do need to be treated completely different than a average town that the MGA is specifically dealt is specifically aimed at. Thank you, Peter. So with that, we'll end the first part of our forum. We're just going to take a quick 15-minute break, and then after that, we will resume our questions. If you have your cue cards, you can hand them to my logistics helper, DJ, or my um, support person, Stephanie, over here. Um, if you require a cue card, you can also ask one of them. So 15-minute break. Um, hope you're back in your seats after that. Thank you. Yeah, so this time we only ha well, I'm only going to give one minute for the crowdsource questions because I want to get through more of the ward-specific questions. So the first question from our um, crowdsource list is for Peter first, Sean second, and the question is, with the vacancy rate approaching 0%, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live in Calgary? Peter, you have two minutes. Oh, one minute, sorry. No, I want the two. No, I'm kidding. Um, okay, for starters, we've been what, what we're going to be starting to do is uh, encourage. We're encouraging developers to build affordable housing. Uh, we've actually started doing that in the last two ASPs, area structure plans that council has passed, uh, where we've uh, requested, suggested, strongly encouraged, uh, in writing that five to ten percent of the housing makeup actually is going to be affordable housing. 
Uh, another area that we're going to be working on is through area, in the area redevelopment uh, of the established city, we do density bonusing where we're allowing them a higher FAR or higher floors, so to speak, more, de more density if they allow, uh, if they accommodate for affordable housing. Uh, also, what we end up doing is through the Calgary Housing Corporation, we are basically setting up with three levels. You've got basically deep subsidy, subsidy, and regular rate rates so that the, the building itself is sustainable and doesn't have to take any extra subsidies. Thank got you, it done. Peter, sorry. <laughs> Sean, you have one minute just to ensure time. So part of the solution would be secondary suites, but it's not the whole solution by any means. Um, Definitely new developments where they are encouraging developers to have a, a mixed kind of uh, mixed use and um, different levels of affordability can can go into those uh, new complexes. The uh, transit oriented developments um, are going to be big. We just have to make sure they're done the right way. Um, we can't just for the Anderson TOD, you cannot have like a 20 story building there, um, it's just going to add too much traffic to the area. Um, those kind of things maybe work at the university, but I'm not saying that we should be against TODs. TODs are a good idea. Um, you want to have increased density by a transit, by a C train line. But, uh, you know, we got to look at a whole kind of mixed bag of, you know, a multi-pronged attack to kind of uh, solve this issue for young people in the city. Thanks. Anybody want to respond? Nope. So I'll move on to the next crowdsource question. This one will go for Sean first, Peter second. And the question is, what would you do to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative and how would your efforts improve that initiative? So you have two minutes. One minute. Oh, one, oh, I keep forgetting. Sorry. One minute. Um, well, this is an initiative that, uh, yeah, definitely I would, I would support, and uh, to City Council's credit, it is something that they support too. Um, as I mentioned before, this city is, uh, has affordability issues. Not everyone here makes $250,000 a year. Um, most of us don't. So um, when you're looking at poverty strategies, we want to keep the city affordable. Um, we want to make sure that people have enough money to do what they need to do without I'm getting too much handouts. So um, one thing that I had come across was my neighbor was talking to me about it. He was involved in this a long time ago. It was called Calgary Dollars, where people can actually trade volunteer service for goods and services. So um, the whole premise here is that people have worth. People have skills that have worth. Um, they're not just looking for a handout. They can contribute to Calgary. Um, and you know, maybe get some groceries or get, you know, a reduction in taxes or something. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So that ends our crowdsource uh, part. No. Oh, Peter. sorry. Oh, sorry. So you're going to put a yes. No, I'd like to actually have my one minute. <laughs> you're what, Started yeah. with Sean. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to use a poker chip? No, no, it's oh, 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 sorry. It's okay. Sorry. I, no worries, Jeremy. I, I, I'm not good at monitoring. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you, you're doing great. You are. Next one will be even easier. Trust me. Sorry. Um, okay, so I have been supportive of both the provinces and the mayor's initiatives for ending homelessness and poverty reduction. Um, this, part, this council has, as I was saying, come up with different policies with regards to the Calgary Ho Housing Corporation with the three different levels and bands of, of, of homes, of not homes, of unit accommodation to basically not just allow for deep subsidies for people that need it, but, for, but to keep it as a sustainable entity in of itself. But more to the point, what we need, it doesn't and it cannot be to actually end homelessness and poor. Fact is, we never will. We're going to do our best. We're going, to do our, we're going to do an awful good job of it. But what really needs to happen is this has to come from the community. This has to come from, we need to encourage community slash faith-based outreach programs. If we're, able to, if we're ever able to actually do some solid good, it can't come strictly from the government. Thank you, Peter. Does anybody want to respond now legitimately to the question? No, I had my minute. You had your minute? All right, <laughs> good. So now we're going to move on to the how round. This is a quick round of questions. You can not use your chips uh, for this round. Sometimes it's difficult uh, 
pr to provide a very specific points in your small brochure or on your website, and it can get a little bit too wordy. This is your chance to pro uh, sorry. This is your chance to provide details. So this round is called the how round. So basically, what we did was we just took your campaign literature out there, and we just kind of went through it, and we're going to ask you a question on something you uh, have on your campaign brochure. And Oh, sorry, this will be for 45 seconds since there's only two of you. So I'm just going to randomly choose blue chips. So Peter gets to go first. Dream the lightning round. <laughs> so, Peter, on your brochure, you said, I am well aware of the concerns relating to traffic and safety, as my family and I share those concerns as well. So the question is, how will you address? concerns relating to traffic and safety. You have 45 seconds. Well, a great deal of it has to do with community awareness. I have been involved in a program uh, uh, that was, uh, was it Chi the Calgary Schools Neighborhood Watch? Hmm, can't remember the, ana the analogy. But basically it's raising awareness of what's happening in the community, where, where there are uh, actual hotspots. Something else that I've been trying to work on is combining the playground and schools, school ground zones. I'm in regular conversation with both, both McIver and Alberta Transportation because it's rather confusing to end, start a school zone, end a school zone, start a playground, end a playground zone. Um, it's actually a much more complicated topic than you can do in 45 seconds, but thank you for the time. <laughs> thank you, Peter. So, Sean, on your brochure, you wrote, our current spending levels are unsustainable. We need to make sure that we make the most efficient use of our tax dollars. So the question is, how will you make the most efficient use of our tax dollars? And you have 45 seconds. Well, when you have a finite amount of resources, you have to do what all of us do at home. Um, you have $200, you can't go out and buy uh, an iPhone, a new TV, a new car, you have to make hard decisions. So uh, we need to be super critical on the projects we do. These are not small projects. We're talking 300 million for this. We're talking $1.4 billion for the West LRT. So I'm not against building infrastructure. I'm all for building infrastructure. But because of the, the infrastructure that we have built, um, I don't think has been the, exactly the wisest choice. So we are stuck in situations where we don't have money to do other things. So. Um, yes, we have to have a critical review process. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So we're going to get into your questions now, and I'm going to try and get through four or five of them, uh, and as time permits. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to the questions, and I see that um, everybody still has a lot of poker chips left, so it's probably a good time to use them up before your uh, closing statements. But I'll try to get through this. I thought they were good for burgers. If we yeah. Didn't. No? Okay. So we're just going to randomly draw again for our first board question. And it's going to be Peter first, Sean second. And the first question, I hope I get this right. Um, will you get the city to censure the province for failing to open the Southeast Ring Road. And we looked up censure in the dictionary, and it was to officially rebuke the province for failing to open the Southeast Ring Road. So I hope I got that right. Um, Peter, you have two minutes. Am I going to encourage council to censure the province? I don't know if that's legally feasible. Um, I think they're taking. I think the province has taken enough of it on the chin in the papers with regards to not being able to have it open uh, by October first. Um, having said that, I'm not entirely sure what a censure to the province would actually accomplish. I would rather work with the province to say, let's. Well, for that matter, for every day you're you're late on building that one, can you put an extra million dollars or seventy-five thousand into the uh, 22x overpass? Um, so, no, I can't say that I'd be in a hurry to do that. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Sean, you have two minutes. Wow. Two minutes for that question. Um, uh, this is a situation where I do, I do agree with Peter here. Um, I don't think we will get much by censuring them. Uh, we want to work with them. 
from what I understand, it's not like it's going to be like a two year delay. It's, it's something that is going to happen within, you know, the next month or two. And, um, you know, they are, the company Chinook is being billed at $75,000 per day for it. So they are getting penalized for it already. Um, do you want to keep the pressure on? For sure. You want to be checking with them, you know, not every hour, but maybe every day calling Rick and just asking him what's going on. And at the same time, you could ask him what's going on with the Southwest Ring Road. So that's where I'm coming from. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Does anybody want to respond? Yeah, no. No? No? Okay. <laughs> that's fine. I know it's a, an interesting question. <laughs> so the next question, two minutes, and it will go to Sean first, Peter second. The question is, with the current deficit Calgary faces, and since you both seem to be opposed to tax increases, how will you balance the budget without cutting funding to social programs? The two minutes. Well, um, we're already coming from a situation where we were supposed to have a balanced budget last year. So um, if we're looking to not increase taxes by that much or having a cost of living increase. Um, when we look at our social programs, we just got to make sure that we are getting the most efficient use out of those programs. Um, when I talked to the people at, with the uh, Poverty Talks Forum last time, um, what you did find out is that there is a lot of not-for-profit groups in this city, and a, there's a lot of replication. So I do believe there are a lot greater efficiencies that could be found with you know, if we just spent the time looking at it. Um, I'm not saying that we need to amalgamate them all into a superstore or something like that, but, we, you know, I, I think at one time they were saying there's one or 200 um, agencies working on the same thing. So um, if we can streamline that, we can save a lot of money. Um, I'm all for social issues. I don't... The general thought out, out there is that there is actually enough dollars out there. It's just not being spent in the wisest possible way. So that's where I'm coming from, that uh, um, we want to keep attention on it. They're super important, but we can revise the system so we find greater efficiencies and uh, reduce spending that way. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Peter, you have two minutes. Well, the question's flawed. We have a balanced budget every year. We cannot do anything but have a balanced budget. That's part and parcel of, of the mandate the province gives to the cities, is that you have to have this, you can only do this much. We are not allowed to run a deficit. It's just not legally allowed. Um, so just wanted to clear that up. As far as the social programs, um, social programs by their very nature are supposed to be a provincial mandate. And over the last 25 years, they've basically downloaded or reneged on a lot of their responsibilities. So what we need to do is get the province to step back into, the ga into this game and uh, work with us on the problem. What we, need for, uh, for what we need for this to happen is not just the city councillors phoning up the, the, the ministers in charge or the party in, in power at the time, but what we need is actual people's voices. We need people in Ward 14, we need people in Ward 6, 9, any number, to actually be phoning the, 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 the province and bringing this to their attention that, listen, this is, the city has stepped in here where it's not really supposed to be. We did it because we have no other choice. We can't just kind of step around somebody that's laying on a street and say, oh, it's, it's not our problem, we can't do anything about that. It's something that we've been pushed into, we've been forced into. But what we need is we need help from the voices, from all of your voices, from the voices of all the Calgarians to say, listen, we need some help here. We've got some serious social issues and we need you to step back into the game and help us. Thank you. Oh, and I see Sean has dropped it. Sure. So you have one minute. So just, just like with everything, I, I would disagree that the province has stepped away from the game. Um, they do have an entire department devoted to these type of issues. Um, what we do need to do is make sure that we talk to them, work together on issues, so we don't have this replication of services and replication of tasks. So can there be greater efficiencies? For sure. Um, I don't know if anything is gained by calling the province out and saying that they're not doing anything and they're not in the game. So from my perspective, we need to work harder with them. Uh, the agencies at 
the municipal and the provincial level need to work together on it. So um, that's where I'm coming from. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Any other responses? Nope. Okay. So my next question will go to Sean first, Peter second. And the question is, how will you help keep our school children safe when crossing Sun Valley Boulevard on their way to and from school? You have two minutes. I didn't know this question was coming either. Um, you know, Sun Valley Boulevard is, is really a unique situation for sure. Um, when they design the communities, it's, it's classified as a, as a major collector road, I think. It's, they also say it's called arterial. Um, the problem with that type of road is that the speed limit's higher. It's, uh, it's not 50, it's 60. Uh, and the problem with Sun Valley Boulevard is due to its location, it really encourages cut throughs through, uh, especially with all of the construction that's going on right now. Um, when we look at the McLeod 22X interchange, um, it, it's, it's gonna be just as bad or worse because uh, we're not gonna be able to funnel the traffic through so people are gonna come through there. So, so that interchange is key to helping Sun Valley Boulevard. Um, there are other things we can do by, uh, you know, increasing photo radar, that kind of thing. That proves to be a little bit effective, but not, doesn't have a major effect. So just like anything, we gotta look at a multi-pronged approach. Um, I, I've heard of people adding, uh, I've talked to people in Sundance and Minipur, um, adding a traffic light at the Fish Creek entrance. You know, maybe that will kind of disrupt the flow enough where people aren't speeding through the neighborhood. Uh, are we looking at pedestrian overpasses? Potentially. Uh, but it is, does make everyone super nervous because there are big, when there's an accident on Sun Valley Boulevard, it's a big accident. It's not, it's not a little one. And that's usually because the speeds are much greater than 60. So, that, so that's the problem that we're facing is that kids cross these roads to go to school. Um, I think if you could go back in time, they would have never designed it that way. But uh, unfortunately, the road is what it is. Um, one of my ideas was for a reclassification. I, I realize it's difficult, but we do have to see what makes Sun Valley Boulevard a major collector and maybe you can take a couple of those things away to make it not a major collector. Thanks. Thank you. We have two, I think it's two minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, yeah, Sun Valley Boulevard is definitely a unique road. There's no question about it. Um, what I have been doing on it is coming up with some unique solutions, I think. One of them that we're trying out as a pilot project is a solar-powered crosswalk. These are far less expensive uh, solution than a uh, wired in crosswalk basically in the eight to ten thousand dollar range as opposed to anywhere from thirty five to ninety five thousand dollars we've got one on in place in sun valley boulevard my understanding is it's being well received and it is doing its job uh, i would hope that once this pilot project is done we might be able to actually start using these in a number of locations wherever there is a crosswalk that is of concern there are a couple of them still on sun valley boulevard that i'm hoping to see come forward uh, they're cost efficient enough that at some point I'm hoping that a community association themselves might be able to raise funds, raise uh, enough funds to actually purchase them and as long as the city is okay with it, actually have them installed and the locations looking for it. Uh, a couple other suggestions that I'm trying to work forward is try to enclose the roadway. The roadway is designed, unfortunately, that my understanding is you can go easily 80 or 90 kilometers. Isn't that right, Sean? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> The, I saw you <laughs> driving that fast, by the way. <laughs> um, but, but, the idea, but, but the idea for most traffic management is you try to make the driver of a vehicle less inclined to speed. And what you do, but what you, the way you do that is you put not obstacles or barriers, but hindrances along the roadway to say, listen, it is not quite as clear and easy sailing and driving as it looks. So if we can get more bushes, more amenities, whether it be an entrance sign, whether it be another series of um, signage of any, any sort. I'm still looking for suggestions along those lines, but at this point, because I have run into difficulties, I have not been able to convince council to change their CTP, to change the collector designation. Um, we're looking for different ways of impacting the driver himself. Thank you, Peter. Anybody want to respond? Nope. Okay. So, he says, anyone like there's anyone else here? <laughs> <laughs> Billy? No. So I just want to remind, it's a, we want to stay issues focused on these questions. Um, the next question is for 
Sean. And then Peter. Sorry. It's getting awkward. You're always going first. I know. The question is, what are you going to do to downsize the power and number of administrators at the city of Calgary? Ooh, that's a good question, too. Um, I don't want to come in like this guy who's going to go in there and clear City Hall out and fire everybody. Um, you know, we saw what happened with Reagan and the uh, air traffic controllers way back when. Um, do I believe there's greater efficiencies that could be found? Definitely. Um, one idea I have uh, is a departmental review in the spotlight. So this idea would kind of have one big city department per quarter come before council and just, and we're not talking in negative spotlight, they, they can have positive things. Um, city, the city of Calgary just did this with their open doors policy this past weekend. But what I'm talking about is actually doing a little bit of crowdsourcing, doing some community consultation. Um, let's say you have Calgary uh, Parks and Rec come through, that they're in the spotlight for the next quarter. Well, you know, there's a lot of expertise on city council. There's a lot of expertise within other city departments. What can we do to make this department run as efficiently as possible? Um, we did something similar to this in, in a company I used to work for where we, we called it a cost reduction committee and all of the managers had to be in this committee. And we helped each other's departments actually find a lot of cost savings. So um, I'd love for them to come through council. Council actually cannot be an expert on anything, like not, not on anything, on everything. So uh, it would actually be a very good learning opportunity, opportunity for council to actually be able to go through this process with all of the different departments. Um, because there are so many departments, you wouldn't have them coming through like every year. You'd have them probably coming through every three or four years, uh, maybe once a term. And, uh, you know, city council, other city managers, and uh, very importantly, people who work for those departments could give their suggestions and the public lar at large could give su suggestions for cost reductions and efficiencies. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Peter, you have two minutes. Well, what I actually have done in the last three years and have gotten embedded in the council uh, fiscal program is something that is called zero-based service reviews. Uh, what this program is, is it takes one department roughly every six months. It analyzes it from the, from the ground up and it has to defend exactly what it's doing, how it's doing, the services it's offering, why it's offering these services, and it goes through this review in a very in-depth manner. Um, this, these reviews are being done every six months. They will be, right now, Parks is in the process of this service review. Roads is the next one up for this service review. We have finished doing the first two projects were uh, Fleet and... Hmm, sorry escapes me what the other one was um, but we were finding the process and we are actually in the we are moving forward to say listen we have to look at every single department and eventually the idea is is that these do get done every term we're going to be short uh, once once we get the process perfected it will be being done to every major department every term thank you thank you and sean's going to cash in his check you have one minute Sorry, and I, I actually don't think I answered the question about the, uh, the managers and, and getting rid of managers, sorry, that was the question? Administrators. Administrators. So, um, yeah, you definitely are looking for efficiency. You're looking for replication of, of tasks. Uh, so, in that situation, I'm not saying that we go out and fire a whole bunch of people, but we do need to look to see what is the most efficient way to run a department. Um, an idea I have for community, uh, community association charters is to actually let some communities do some tasks like watering the trees or snow clearing with a certain amount of revenue that comes from the city to, to set their budgets at. Um, and this idea is just to see if a community could do something better with a private contractor than with the city services. Um, it would be a pilot project and it would be something that it could be better, it could be worse, but you never know until you try. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Any other responses? Nope. Nope. Okay, so the next question. I'll go to Peter and then to Sean. And the question is longer, so you, can, um, if you need me to repeat it, please do. The question is, 
can you each tell us what your municipal housing strategy looks like? Include homeless persons, rich people, seniors on low income, women fleeing violence, and youth transitioning from foster care in your answer. And you have two minutes. Do you want me to get another question? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, can we, can, we, can we answer that by saying we support it? <laughs> I, that, 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 that's a question that can't be answered in two minutes. I mean, that's a, that's a thesis statement. So, so maybe you can, can you each tell us what your municipal housing strategy looks like? You have two minutes, Peter. Sorry. Um, Build houses, build them often, build them well. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I was being facetious there. Uh, a municipal housing strategy. Um, cities and governments have been working on a housing strategies for decades and we're still trying to find the right strategy going forward. Um, my ideas with regards to housing is to try and allow people to build houses. The, the, the best strategy for a housing strategy is a strong economy, is to make sure that people have jobs that they can depend on in order to make a mortgage, in order to make a down payment. Um, as far as uh, we, we've gone through a number of those already with strategies that the city is already in, in process of that I've been involved with in the last three years of encouraging developers to uh, have to, to build, uh, um, uh, sorry, kind of lost my thought there, to encourage builders to build subsidized housing, to have different levels of housing in the Calgary Housing Corporation in order to keep them uh, in a sustainable manner. Um, I'm sorry, but that's, that's about as good as I've got. Okay, thank you, Peter. Sean, you have two minutes. Yeah, it is a difficult question. Two minutes isn't going to do it by any means. Um, you have a, you mentioned a lot of different groups that uh, come from a lot of different markets. Um, obviously, when builders are building houses, they, they are concerned with making money, and that's, you know, I'm not going to hide that fact. Builders are builders. They're in an in-profit um, industry. Um, we do have to consult with all the stakeholders, and we're talking about uh, poverty groups, women's groups, um, free market forces, We're, we really got to balance what is perceived social engineering versus market forces. And there's no magic solution that says, you know, if we, fo if we follow market forces, then everything will be all great and hunky and dory. Uh, because we're, pro we're probably going to forget about the people who need um, affordable housing. But, you know, you can't go on the social engineering side either and just be totally like that because you're ignoring the market forces and so you're building all these types of houses and you're not able to fill them with um, and the builders are not making enough money so they're deciding to leave town and build elsewhere so um, for me it's a, you have to consult with all the stakeholders um, the builders are not evil people uh, that they, they want to help the city out too um, yeah and make a profit while doing it that that's their industry so you know we'd like to consult the city, builders, all of the different stakeholder groups that were mentioned, just to make sure that we are coming up with solutions that help everyone. Um, you know, obviously there are going to be certain neighborhoods and you're going to have certain areas where you do have NIMBY, uh, NIMBY concerns, uh, but if we can consult properly and give people the information, there will be a lot less fear out there in terms of what, what, what the solution will end up being. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. So I have one more question from the floor. I know you guys still each have um, a lot of poker chips, so um, feel free to uh, use them for this last question. And before I begin this question, I just want to highlight to stay issues focused because this is a very particular question. Just no um, personal uh, references for this question. Um, and the question is, Sean, how are you different from Peter? And for Peter, how are you different from Sean? So, here we go. So, Peter, you get two minutes and you get to go first. I'm bald, I'm middle-aged. Oh, wait, no. Um, how am I different from Sean? Um, 
I'm not entirely sure if that's a question that I'm going to be able to answer because I don't really know Sean that well on a personal level. Uh, I know that I have been working for the last three years specifically to get in touch with the people of Ward 14 to try and to have them express their views to me because I believe in that. I believe that you have a voice that you should be using and if you're not using, others will use for you. Uh, I believe that it's an area that we are sadly mistaken as it is sadly, un it is sadly underused at the municipal le level how much the municipality affects your lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm regularly trying to go out into the community, whether it be to every single community association event, whether it be through the number of numerous alder talks I have, whether it be phoning people on a random basis, surveying people through the regs, res, regular terms to find out what their issues are, what their concerns are, and to have them tell me what their concerns are so that I can actually make some meaningful impact in their lives. Um, it's, it's a matter of saying, you have something that is absolutely golden. It's called a vote. It's called being a member of the city of Calgary, and you should use it for all it's worth in getting involved, in letting people know how you feel about a certain topic, in letting others know how you feel on a certain topic. It's, it's very easy to go home at night, turn on, close the garage door, go upstairs and watch some TV and go to bed at night. It's a lot tougher to have that volunteer spirit, to have your voice be known, be heard. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it's so valuable. I cannot, I cannot encourage it enough. Thank you, Peter. And Sean, you have two minutes. Well, another tough question. Um, I'd say my last name has only three letters in it, so I'm automatically twice as efficient as Peter, who has six letters, his last name. But uh, no, it, it's a tough question. I get it asked at the doors, and um, I really try not to come out and, and be personal about anything. Uh, we're both here working hard. We're both trying to get your vote. Um, it, it takes a lot to run for office, and I give Peter all the respect in the world for that. Um, it takes a lot to do, do the job, for sure. Um, probably the main difference that I see is that I'm, I'm louder than Peter. Um, I would be a louder voice. Um, when I see Shane Keating over there jumping up and down for the Southeast LRT, um, I would be right there beside him. And, hey, Shane, what do you need? you want to step on my shoulders? Do you want to get higher? That kind of thing. Um, I'm not seeing a ton of co collaboration between the Southern Aldermen. Um, when the Northeast Aldermen wanted to get the airport tunnel, you couldn't turn on the TV and not see those guys' faces together. Um, they went out, they lobbied hard for that airport tunnel. Um, they got the city believing that it was a critical project. Okay? So, I guess, you know, there are, there are different decisions that Peter made that I would have made differently. Um, when I tell people at the doors, I, I'm saying, you know, I'm not here to say Peter's a bad guy. We just would have made different decisions. But I guess the main difference between myself and him is that I, I do think I'm louder. I do think that... Um, I know how to get build consensus and get people on side. Uh, that's what I have to do at work all the time uh, when parties hate each other. And uh, that's what I have to do on the community association, association board. You, you on the boards know what I'm talking about. That I got to grab hockey and I gra got to grab figure skating and get them together and pointing them in the right direction. So I think that's where I, I differ is that I can build consensus and get results. Thank you, Sean. Are there any responses? Okay, Peter, so you have one minute. Um, so, I guess a couple other things did come to mind uh, as far as being differences. I have been a business owner for the last 17 years. Being a business owner means you stand on your own. You don't have somebody to, to report to to say, oh, I'm not going to be able to get that back in time. You don't have a boss. You are your boss, and if you don't make it work, you don't survive. So there's a certain skill set there that I'm not entirely sure that my opponent here has. Over and above that, you have to do your homework if you're your own business owner, and your homework is a huge aspect to this job. Um, with regards to the homework, there are a couple of comments that my opponent had made in the opening with regards to the airport tunnel that I'd like to correct him on. The fact of the matter is, yes, it's a $295 million tunnel, but it's not just a tunnel. It's an entire airport trail roadway connector. It connects the entire east section of the city. 
where we're expecting to have 100,000 people move to in the next 30 years. This is akin to one and a half, almost, Ward 14s. The cost of the tunnel itself is only $128 million, not so different than any major interchange product, such as the Elbow McLeod Trail to Glenmore Trail project was $105 million in, that was about approximately 10 years ago. The 100,000 people that are going to be moving into the Northern Corridor Without the east-west road connector, we weren't going to be able to allow them to build there. The traffic impact assessment was not going to allow that to happen. We're only going to be able to put 50,000 people in there. With this travel, with this road connector, we're going to be able to put that extra 50 to 60,000 people in. That equates to 25,000 homes on average, low average, $2,000 income tax per home. That's $50 million a year of extra tax revenue that we wouldn't have without the tunnel. With the tunnel, we have an extra LRT connector. With the uh, the Calgary International Airport is the third busiest in Canada. It is going to be offering 40,000 more jobs in the next forecast in the next 30 years, not to mention the added non-residential property tax revenue revenue from these businesses. The LRT, the transit, the tunnel is going to accommodate LRT to the airport within a generation sooner than, than, than was originally forecast. It also is going to allow us a separate access to the, to the airport. It's the one called Stony Trail, which it will be connecting to. If you've ever been on Deerfoot Trail when there's been an accident trying to get to the airport, good luck, ain't gonna happen. This way there is going to be another access, an access that I believe Ward 14 residents will use. Having said all of that, if we had not built it, it would still have cost 325 to $425 million if he'd read the report, he would know this, not to do anything, just to upgrade the seven interchanges surrounding that tunnel. If we decided to build it after the fact in 20 years, it would be an astronomical one and a half to two billion dollars. Thank you. Just before uh, Sean, you begin, I just want to remind candidates to stay issues focused. I know this question can uh, be a little heated at times, but I just want to make sure that it's issues focused. So Sean, you have uh, one minute. Do you want to use your remaining chips? I'll go with one and see what happens. Okay. Okay. You have one minute. So uh, yes, I did read the report. And um, it's a situation where, in 2009, City Council decided not to do this airport because of the cost and the federal and the provincial government not chipping in any, in any money. At that time, the airport authority said, this is not a critical project. What I'm worried about is when, during the last election, a few mayoral candidates made some promises and this came back online. It always seems to be magic when numbers seem to appear that support somebody's point of view. Um, I only wish we had the problems that the Northeast has right now. Here in Ward 14, we develop like crazy, and we have two roads. We have McLeod Trail and we have Deerfoot. And, um, you know, with, when you're talking about, oh, you can only develop 50,000 people here or versus 100,000, I wish somebody would have taken that into account when they were building our neighborhoods. Um, if we could go back in time, I, I could probably tell you that they're probably not following that rule that they're trying to apply to the Northeast right now. I'm not against building infrastructure. Do I think there's going to be a lot of people in the Northeast? Yes. Do I think there's going to be a lot of people in the Southeast that could have been served by a Southeast LRT? Yes. Okay, so, you know, I don't really want to get into this regional debate of whether we should have this or have that, but when I look at it and you look at, you know, did, do we have to build uh, an upgrade seven interchanges to, I don't think so. Stony Trail is a major road. People could come around from the eastern freeway, go up, and there could be an interchange at Barlow to come down. That could be their way. Um, we don't have a shorter way to get, the, get to the airport. I don't know why we should be spending so much money so somebody else does. That's where I'm coming from. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. And that ends our questions for tonight. Um, I want to provide each of our candidates with a one-minute closing for our evening. So since we started with Sean um, at the beginning, we will start with Peter for your closing statement. And you have one minute. I would, whoa, 10 seconds. Uh, I would like to continue my dedicated service to Ward 14. Um,
continued continuity and experience is, is, is absolutely vital. There are some very important projects coming forward that I'd like to be able to represent Ward 14 as effectively as I have for the last three years. Uh, it, is, it, it is an area that I feel very... Hmm. Ward 14 is the most beautiful portion of the city. It is an area I've spent many, many years dealing with, and it shouldn't surprise anybody that I want to continue to re represent Ward 14. There is a learning curve when you are elected as a councillor, and it is similar to drinking from a fire hose. I have gone through that process. I have become a very, very strong voice on council, and I would like to continue representing Ward 14. Thank you, Peter. And Sean, you have one minute. Thanks again for everyone to, for coming out and also to Civic Camp and to Mid-Sun Community Association. I hope you guys have received some answers tonight, and if you still have some questions, I'd love to stick around and chat with you. At the end of the day, I'm running to re represent you and the rest of Ward 14. My motivations are at home getting ready for bed right now. I'm very concerned with how we balance our fiscal responsibilities with our planning and development for the future. If we don't achieve the right balance, we risk our kids' futures. If we don't achieve the correct balance, we risk running into the ground everything the previous generation has built up for us. I, for one, am not willing to go down that road and will do everything in my power to make sure the right decisions are made. Um, you know, it's not enough to say no. An effective counselor needs to be able to present viable alternatives and build consensus to get the job done. Because at the end of the day, getting the job done is all that matters. My name is Sean Keo, and I want to get this job done for you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And keep the quorum here. So thank you very much for the candidates and all the best on election day. I want to say a big thank you to all the civic campers who have been volunteering and all the citizens who came out today who submitted their questions online and uh, on the floor. I would also like to thank our sponsors, uh, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, Metro Calgary, Calgary Sound Rentals, Calgary Road Runners, Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils, the Alberta Teachers Association, Students Association of MRU, as well as the U of C Students Union, Calgary Foundation, and our host tonight, the mid Sun Community Association, as well as Livestream Calgary for doing the uh, online bit. So remember, Civic Camp is hosting all these forums uh, throughout the election, and you're eligible to vote for. So please visit civiccamp.org for the dates and details. So good night, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming out once again. Thank you.